Jesus told us to pray to the Father. Right? In Matthew 6, 6, he said, But you, when you pray, pray to your Father who is in secret, unseen, unseen place, is in heaven. There's no secret where God is. Everybody know where God is? God the Father? Everybody? Where's God? Where is He? He's in heaven. Right? The Bible keeps telling us He's in heaven. Okay, well, that's kind of a secret place, but He's in heaven. He's on the throne in heaven. And your Father will reward you openly. How many of you want to be rewarded openly by the Father in heaven? Boy, I do. You, you did. <laughs> right? I mean, we, you know, is there a day in your life when it's like, hey God, I've been rewarded so much, why don't you just take a break and not have a reward day? <laughs> it's like, come on, bring on the rewards. So, quick question. Um, who can tell us who King David said that he prayed to? You know, Psalms, you all read Psalms. David prays, most of the Psalms of David praying to, who, to who? The Lord. The Lord, right? Okay, that's good. He didn't know that he was praying to Jesus and he didn't know he was praying to the Father. He was just praying to the Lord. The Jews to this day have the Shema, right? There is one God, right? Which means there's one God family, right? And most people can't get, you know, they say, okay, this is a paperclip. This is one paperclip. There's not two. There's one paperclip, right? But, but each of you who have set up families, you know, husband and wife get married and have children, that's one family, right? And most people have trouble getting past that. But anyhow, so King David didn't know that he was paying, <coughs> praying to Jesus, the God of the Old Testament, but he just said to the Lord. But he understood what Jesus is now telling us, pray to the Father, because the Father is running everything, right? We, a lot of, on radio, Christian radio and Christian worship music, Jesus is the focus a lot of the time. Jesus is running everything only because his Father is letting him run a whole bunch of stuff, right? But Jesus, in his own words, keeps pointing back to the Father. Everything I'm telling you, they're not my words. They're my Father's words. I'm telling you what he told me to tell you. Jesus wants us to focus on the Father's will. Matthew 6, 9. Pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will, Father, be done on earth as it is done in heaven. If you could go to heaven right now, would there be any war? <laughs> Would there be any children crying, dying in the streets? There would be nothing like we've got here on planet Earth. It's the Father's will and everything is running like clockwork. And even when Satan comes to visit, it's like, oh, here's Satan. Hey, Satan, what are you up to? Oh, I'll be walking around the Earth. Yeah? Well, what do you think about Job? Right? It's like, God's not phased. God is not worried. They don't, they don't ring the alarm and say, quick, get out the troops. Satan's coming. It's like, Satan has no power unless God allows Satan to have certain power, which he will in the tribulation. So if we read verse 10 very slowly, we will see that we are asking our Father to help us personally be doing his will on earth every day. It's, it's, if you're, you've got to go slow, because if you go real fast, it'll be like, your will be done on earth and this is done in heaven uh, sometime in the future. Well, sure, that's going to happen. That's going to happen in the future. But how about today? Well, all those other people, they're not going to do your will. Okay, how about you? Are you going to do the Father's will on earth today? And that's part of the message of that verse, right? Jesus came to earth to tell us about the Father and to reveal the Father's thinking. So all of the thinking we think is Jesus' thinking is actually the Father's thinking. Right? And Jesus said, my Father and I are one in thought. We think alike. We are on the same page, as we say. John 12, 49. For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who, gave, who sent me gave me command of what I should say and what I should speak. He kept saying that. You'll see that many times in the New Testament. All of the words of Jesus are actually <coughs> given from the Father's mind, the Father's thinking, what the Father is planning for the universe forever, all into, into all eternity. John 12, 50. 
and I know that his command is everlasting life. Now, everybody wants everlasting life. Everybody thinks, give your heart to the Lord, Jesus, and you'll go to heaven when you die, and you'll have everlasting life in heaven, sitting at the feet of Jesus, right? No, the command of the Father is everlasting life. We just saw that in John 12, 50. Therefore, what I speak, just as the Father told me, so I speak. I was dedicated and duty-bound to serve God the Father in every way, and we should be too. And Jesus is our classic example because we, we see him walking and we see him talking and we see him dying and we see him in the scriptures and we don't see the Father doing anything except sitting on the throne, right? But it's all the Father's thinking. Jesus gives us eternal life, but only by the commands of the Father. Now, billions and billions have worshipped Jesus over the last 2,000 years, but few are focused on the Father's plan for all creation. A classic there, I'll jump ahead. Classic there is, is <clears throat> two billion now are teaching, you're going to go to hell if you don't accept Jesus in this lifetime and before, if you're in a coma, right, or whatever, if you don't accept Christ, you're going to hell. That's it. That's what God has said. You will go to hell forever and ever and be tortured in pain and suffering forever and ever and ever because you didn't accept Jesus. Well, what if you were born and died before there was a Jesus? Oh, don't, don't get down in the weeds. Don't worry about that, right? <clears throat> so Jesus tells us this in John 4, 23. The hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, not the false worshipers, the true worshipers, will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. Now, why is the Father seeking true worshipers to worship the Father? Does he need our worship? Or does he want us to worship him for our own good? That's the point of that verse, and you can read it either way you want. But God the Father wants the best for you, and the best for you is to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father wants trillions. Now, this, this might curl your hair, some of you, right? The Father wants trillions of mature children to live with him into eternity. Question, how do we know that the Father wants trillions of mature Christian, uh, children, right? We're all the children of God, right, one way or the other. 2 Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but long suffering towards us, not willing that anybody perish, second death, be dead forever, but that all, everybody, should come to repentance. That's the will of the Father. That's what he wants, right? And he's got this plan running. We've had six, almost 6,000 years of it now, again, right up against the end of the 6,000 years, right? And this is phase one. Phase one points out to humanity and human beings, you can't control and govern yourself in peace and tranquility without using the Spirit of God. Every time you try, you end up killing people. Putin, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions died. What, uh, World War II, 50, 60 million people died. Why? Because Hitler decided he was going to capture some more nations, right? And guess what? Nobody stopped him until, what, 1945. And, and, and he wouldn't have been stopped if the Germans hadn't woken up the sleeping giant. And I believe there's another sleeping giant. There's, there's two more sleeping giants that we can talk about it later. But anyhow, <clears throat> the father wants trillions of mature, and he doesn't want anybody to perish. Perish means second death. God wants everyone to come to repentance. Most people don't even understand what that is. And then he wants them to live godly. Wow. Sure. Two billion people are living godly. Aren't they? Mm, maybe yes. Maybe no. Are they worshipping the Father in spirit and in truth? No. They're not worshipping in truth. And then after they live godly on earth, he wants them to join him living out there into all eternity. 
great benefits come to each person who learns how to worship in spirit and in truth. So, so every early class on Christianity should focus on we're worshiping the Father, we're praying to the Father. When you say, Father, help me, and you get helped, who do you say thank you to? Jesus? Maybe, yeah. Primarily, Father. Thank you, Father. Right? Those of, us who, those of you who had good fathers, you know how powerful a good father can be. My father died when I was a baby, so I never knew my father. Right? I've seen a photograph of him. But um, the father relationship throughout history has been a very powerful relationship, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad. Right? But God says, I am the pinnacle of power in the universe, and I want you to call me Dad. Abba, Father. There's that phrase in the Bible. Abba, Father. Daddy, Daddy. Right? And you've seen little kids run up to their father. Daddy, Daddy, help me. Save me. There's spiders in my bed. You know, whatever. <laughs> so God says, it must be this way. It must be. You can't have it any other way. You must worship in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. Sadly, many Jesus worshipers ignore this following danger warning from the lips of Jesus. Matthew 24, 5. For many, most of us know what many is. It's lots and lots, right? Will come in my name, name of Jesus, saying that Jesus is the Christ. Well, that's true, isn't it? Many, turn on your TV Sunday morning. Many are saying that Jesus of Nazareth is, was, the Christ. And they will deceive a few. They will deceive many. So what should we conclude? If we're going to believe Jesus in Matthew 24, 5, we should believe that many are going to preach Jesus is Jesus, and those many are going to deceive many. Now what's our conclusion? Many people are going to be deceived about Jesus. No. <laughs> that can't be right. Surely all these churches can't be wrong. Right? I used to, when I was young, I used to be young, you know that. Anyhow, when I was young, I used to have this thing running around in my head. Well, all these churches can't be wrong. <laughs> and, then, and then it dawned on me. Jesus is saying, the many will be wrong. Okay, why? Because they're not worshipping in spirit and truth, right? So many ignore this giant warning from Jesus which says large numbers or most people will become deceived and that's where we are today. We have most people being deceived in the church, out of the church. So this is why the Father says we must learn to worship him in spirit and in truth. Otherwise, don't expect good things to happen, at least not until the second resurrection. The Father has made certain days as holy time and is set apart for godly service days. Most people, nah, I'm just going to worship seven days a week. I will treat every day of the week holy because I'm a holy person. Well, then don't do any work. Now, for some people, that's easy because they get a check from the government. <laughs> Right. But, but in order to keep seven days a week holy, you can't do any work. Oh, that doesn't sound too well. <laughs> All right, Leviticus 23 shows us the eight holy appointments that God has chosen and blesses each year. Leviticus 23, 1. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, he's setting up this new nation of Israel, God's nation, and he says, Moses, go tell them this. Verse 2. Speak to the children of Israel and say unto them concerning the feasts. When I first came to the knowledge of God's truth and to the church, I heard this verse and I heard that word, the feasts, the feasts, the feasts. Now, what's cute is my, my wife, who was not baptized at the time, ended up in Ambassador College in Big Sandy, unbaptized and, un and like placed out deer in the headlights kind of. Right? Anyhow, she got there and they started the classes and some one of the students said to her, 
Isn't it great? In two weeks we get off for the feast. You know what came to her mind? Roman orgy. <laughs> she almost packed up her bags and went home. The feast. She'd read too many novels about Roman orgies, I guess, or whatever. Anyhow, it doesn't say feast. It's not the Hebrew word for feast. And praise God, I have now found a Bible, the New American Standard Bible, right? N-A-S-B. <laughs> you got to remember all the things. Anyhow, which actually says appointments. The Hebrew word there, instead of feast, which is a festival word, it's not the feast word, it's the appointment word. So, concerning the appointments of the Lord, you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, holy meetings. Eight of them are listed here, right? Even these are my appointments. Now, in English, in any language in the world, if you say... The judge down at the courthouse has made an appointment for you, which a judge did not too long ago for my son, and it said calling you for jury duty right, on such and such a day, at such and such a time, at such and such a place. Guess what's going to happen to my son if he doesn't bother the show? He's going to be in trouble with the judge who could then find him in contempt of court and throw him in prison without any fuss at all, right? So if, if it's in a really important person who makes an appointment with you, now most of us, we have appointments with our dentists, we have our appointments with our doctors, right? And we consider that pretty important stuff, right? Especially since when we get there, they make us wait an hour. Well, <laughs> you know, just, uh, how long has he been waiting? Four or five minutes. Okay, give me another 15 minutes and we'll go see him. <laughs> no offense to doctors, but it just it seems like they're always running late, but they're always busy. All right, so Hebrew definition... For that word is an appointment. I put it in the notes. That is a fixed time, a fixed season, specifically a festival. And the reason they put that in there is because New King James and Old King James and most Bibles decided to use feasts. When they could have used, they should have used appointments, but they could have used festivals. How many of you know of some festivals that are coming up in the next couple of weeks in this area? Do you have any festivals? We have the oil festival in Hawkins, Texas. Because Hawkins came bloomed because of oil. We found a lot of oil down in that area. Right? There's the pumpkin festival. There's the you know, there's just hundreds of festivals. Right? And and if it said festival, people say, Oh God, God has some festivals. I wonder what God's festivals are like, and then they would have learned. But they're appointments. God is making appointments with people. Billions are taught that the Leviticus 23 festivals don't apply to New Testament Christians. Anybody ever heard that? Right? Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that was Old Testament, and, and it's really hard to understand why Passover you kill a lamb, the poor little lamb thing. You know, and then you eat weird bread. Nobody eats that weird bread anymore, right? And then Pentecost, whatever that is, you know, right? And then the Day of Atonement, whoa! <laughs> there were a few people I knew of that their first day in the Church of God was the Day of Atonement. <laughs> it's like, so they found out there was a church, and, and I guess somebody who invited them to the church said, oh, next Saturday when you come to church, it's the Day of Atonement, so you can't eat anything. One guy came in with a bottle of water and set it down on the table. It was like, um, can we talk to you? <laughs> like, we, we're not, yeah, yeah. But it's not the best day, the Day of Atonement, to have as your first day in church. It's like, it takes a little adjusting to it, right? So <clears throat> Jesus teaches the exact opposite of what they say about you don't need to worry about the Old Testament holy meetings, appointments with God. And the reason, we got 1 Corinthians 11, 23, for I, Paul writing, I received from the Lord. Paul was knocked off his horse or his camel or his donkey, whatever he was on, right? And he was blind and he's this light in the sky and this voice was talking to him and he said, um, who is it, Lord? Who, who's that? Who's that up there? <laughs> and Jesus 
must have had a grin on his face when he said, it's Jesus. Because <laughs> Paul had been out killing the Jesus people. And it's like, now you're blind and you're talking to Jesus. And guess what? He ain't happy, right? <laughs> but he said, I got work for you to do. So they talked. Once, once Paul was re you know, repented and baptized and had his eyesight re returned, he went and he talked to Jesus face to face and had a whole bunch of questions because Paul was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He knew the Old Testament way and Jesus was teaching the New Testament way and he said, okay, here's how you do this. Here's how you do this. Here's how you... Paul must have said to Jesus, I wish we had this on film. Jesus, Paul must have said, I got to baptize, I got to circumcise all these males that I'm going to bring into your new church, these, these Gentile males. I got to circumcise them. This is going to be crazy. And Jesus explained to me, don't worry, don't worry. We're looking for circumcision of the heart is what we're looking for in the New Testament. <laughs> Paul must go, whew, boy, that's a load on my mind. Right, so... <laughs> Anyhow, so Jesus said here in, in 1 Corinthians 11.23, I mean, Paul is writing it, I got this from the Lord. The Lord told me this face to face, that on the same night in which he was betrayed, there's nobody everywhere, anywhere that argues this wasn't Passover night. He was betrayed in the Passover night because he had to, they had to have the three uh, people on the, on the stakes, on the crosses, taken down, before sunset that afternoon, which was the first day of unleavened bread, the first holy, you know, holy 24 hours day, right? Beginning of days of unleavened bread. So anyhow, in verse 24, he given thanks, he broke the bread, take eat. This is my body. This is a symbol of my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So Jesus taught Paul. Paul taught the Gentiles in the New Testament church. There's no way you can say it's not a New Testament Christian thing. Verse 25, Save manner he took the cup and supper, saying the cup of the new covenant of blood, do this in remembrance of me. So people say, oh, oh, okay, I know what that is. That's communion. No, it's not. It's Passover. It's the Passover wine and it's the Passover bread. And you're supposed to take it only one holy night in the year on Passover night is what Jesus said told Paul to teach the New, Gentile, New, New Testament Gentile. Okay, Jesus told Paul to teach the Passover holy meetings to these New Gentile converts. The many do not understand the truth of the Passover lesson plan because they don't observe Passover as Jesus prescribed. The first time I took Passover, I, I, and what do we do now? And now what happens? And, and what's next? Right? But... I, you know, it looks like I've done, like, trying to figure it out, looks like I've done 53 Passovers. I can't believe I'm that old. But, but anyhow, um, so uh, the Father wanted Paul to be teaching the second holy annual festival of bread. Now, if you say unleavened bread, you instantly have people go, huh, what's that? <laughs> right? Then you have to explain what unleavened means, right? It's the bread festival. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump. This is the New Testament, Corinthians, right? For indeed, Christ our Passover was sacrificed. So if Christ is our Passover, and Christ said, keep Passover, should we not do it? Since he is our Passover, we should do it. If he says do it, we should do it. Verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast festival, holy festival, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sincerity means no mixture. Don't mix truth with error. Now, what happens when you have bread? Right? Ladies, most of you know, some of you guys know, when you make bread, right, you put the fixins, I love that word, you put the fixins in, and then in some cases you add... Leavening. Why? Because you want it fluffy. <laughs> you want it to expand. You want it to look like a loaf of bread instead, <laughs> instead of something a steamroller ran over. Right? <laughs> so, now, if it's just before the days of unleavened bread, you do not want to add leavening. You want all the fixings in the bowl, but no leavening. 
and then you end up with flat, hard, brittle bread, unless you're clever, and you can make cakes that look like regular cakes, but you can promise it that no leavening in the cakes, eggs or something or other, whatever, whatever. So, but it's the professed of unleavened bread from Leviticus 23 in the New Testament, taught by Paul, taught by Jesus, wanted by the Father, because it's a lesson plan of salvation. The Passover Holy Meeting is an annual lesson plan in spirit and in truth that focuses our minds on Jesus the Passover and his teachings. The seventh day festival, the bread festival, focuses our minds on the bread of eternal life or Jesus who is our food source. Now bread was the food source, the primary food source for people throughout history. Today, you can go days without eating any bread and not feel deprived, right? You, there's meat and there's potatoes and there's fish and there's all kinds of stuff you can be eating and you can say, well, I haven't had any bread lately. Now, the third annual lesson plan is about spirit and truth worship is Pentecost. Pentecost means the 50th of the seven weeks of Holy Spirit Festival. Exodus 24, 22. I'm sorry, Exodus 34, 22, you shall observe the Feast of Weeks, the Festival of Weeks, which is the primary and dominant name for the festival. Most of us have skipped over that, and we just call it Pentecost. Now, that's what we see in the New Testament, so we go, ah, Pentecost, right? Which means 50th. <clears throat> you can't have a 50th if you don't have a 49th and a 48th, and a 47th. You have to have seven weeks of seven days, that's 49 days, and then we go to church and we have a holy meeting on a Sunday, right? Because that's how God said to do it. So that's how we do it, right? So observe the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of the harvest. Numbers 28, 26. Also, on the day of the first fruits, you shall bring your new grain offering to the Lord <coughs> at your feast of weeks. It shall be a holy convocation. What's a convocation? It's a meeting. It's, a ho it's an appointment where you have a holy meeting with the church brethren, and you shall do no customary work. That's how you keep it holy. You don't do any customary work, right? And you have the holy meeting. Deuteronomy 16, 9. You shall count seven weeks for yourself. Seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time you begin to put in the sickle to the grain. Verse 10. You shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God. Now, these are his appointments to worship him in spirit and in truth, which is why the many are deceived, because they're not taught the festival plans and how to worship in spirit and in truth. <laughs> Acts 20, verse 16 Paul had decided to sail to Ephesus because um, he was hurrying to get to Jerusalem if possible to be there on the day of Pentecost, a New Testament holy appointment from the Old Testament, Leviticus 23. Most people do not understand rocket science until they begin to study that discipline. Now, if you study rocket science, eventually you're going to understand it. Right? Because you're studying it. Okay, likewise, most people don't understand God's three spirit and in truth lesson plans every spring. Because they don't do it, and they don't study it, and it makes no sense to them. So it's like, well, I don't understand it. Well, then, do you understand everything in your Bible? No. Are you studying it? Yes. Are you learning more? Yes. Okay. Then do what it says and learn more and do the lesson plans of the three spring festivals. So the many are deceived by not doing the Father's lesson plans. John 6, 54. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Well, quick, get me some Jesus flesh and get me some Jesus blood. You do it symbolically, but you only do it on Passover night. You don't do it any time in the year you want to, right? It's Passover bread and it's Passover wine. And if you do that, then you have eternal life. And Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. That's, that's the last day of human activity on earth 
And when Jesus steps in and says, okay, now I'm in charge. King of, new king of the earth. Here comes Jesus, riding on a white horse, new king of the earth. This eats my flesh symbolism is understand through Paul and Jesus in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. We looked at that. Next lesson plan. I am the living bread, John 6, 51. I am the living bread, says Jesus, which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. Now, people who think physically go, well, A, he's not bread. He's human. He's made of flesh, and he's not flesh anymore. He's spirit, right? And he's not bread. He says he's bread. It's symbolic. It's spiritual. But there's a bread festival to remind us and point us to the lesson plans that go with spirit and truth worship. Our Father's springtime lesson plan number two, the Live Forever Bread Festival, is understood in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8, where Jesus, where Jesus taught Paul to say, let us keep the feast with unleavened bread of sincerity and in truth. The third springtime lesson plan is taught through obeying and keeping the 50 days of Pentecost. Luke 24, 49. Behold the promise of the Father I will send if you tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. What's Holy Spirit all about? Why is it a 50-day festival? Because no spirit, no everlasting life. No spirit, no understanding. No spirit, no spirit in truth worship. You gotta have, you must have the spirit to worship in spirit and in truth. Acts 1, 8, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Acts 2, 1, the day of Pentecost was fully come, the 50th day. They were all in one place. Acts 2, 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak as the Spirit gave them utterance. So when our Father says, worship in spirit and truth, it's up to each one of us to know our Bibles, to practice all that the Bible is teaching us. That's how we came to keep Sabbath day. We studied Sabbath day enough to realize nobody had the authority to move at any place. And God said, Sabbath, 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 Friday night, Saturday night, keep the Sabbath. And we say, yes, sir, Lord, we do that. Then we realize Leviticus 23 and the New Testament teachings teach us the springtime festivals, the Passover, the unleavened bread, the bread festival, and the, and the Holy Spirit Festival, these are all the growth lesson plans for eternal life. Now, the four festivals that are in the seventh month, they're not. They're different. They're six months later. And they point to how God is going to save the nations. The springtime, the growth period, is how God saves each person through spirit and truth worship, through the lesson plans, that's why they're so important. So it's up to us to know our Bibles and to be doing what the Bibles teach us to do. These three springtime festivals, lesson plans, are the key to spirit and truth worship and being given eternal life.